Hello everyone, this is Gary Marr from Winnet Community College. This screen captures from my SAS 150 uh, AB online class. And in this screen capture, I'm going to talk about concepts and topics covered in section six of the textbook. This section is all about uh, files and databases, or what we call persistent storage or data persistence. So far in all of our console applications, we really have not stored any information or retrieved any information off a of file or database. Well, needless to say, in business computing anyways, this is something you're going to have to do a lot of. And even sometimes if you have an application that doesn't do a lot of data file storage, it might actually have settings that the user has actually specified that you want to save. So that the next time they go in the application, those settings can be restored. That would require some file handling and some data persistence. So that's the topic covered in this chapter. Uh, as far as definitions go, um, Data persistence kind of implies some sort of secondary storage device, which is hardware. Could be a hard disk, could be a you know, CD-ROM, a thumb drive. There are two kinds of um, uh, formats we're going to talk about in this particular presentation. We're going to spend most of our time with the sequential data files, which are primarily text files of ASCII or Unicode data. These are the kinds of files you could open with Notepad, look at, and read line by line. And then at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll talk a little bit about database files. We don't have any assignments on database files. Um, we're not going to do a lot with databases. We're going to talk about them. We're going to compare them to file systems so you understand what you're, you're going to do with them. There's a MySQL class offered on campus, which is excellent for learning about databases. I would encourage you to take it no matter what your discipline, whether it's web or programming or system admin. You're going to sooner or later have to use a database, and it's probably going to be a relational database. MySQL is a relational database. So let's move to the next slide. And this one is going to talk about file systems. Now, when I'm referring to a file system, I'm talking about a very primitive system like MS-DOS that has a bunch of folders, subfolders, and files that contain text files. Now, once we start getting into certain applications like Word or Excel or Access or a number of other ones, they may not use files which are text-based or ASCII or Unicode. They may use binary files because they're not necessarily files that are storing information as much as they are storing a lot of other things with it, fonts and other information. We're not going to deal with those. That's outside the scope of this class. We're going to spend all of our time on sequential files and file systems. So we need to just talk about some of the terms here. A file system is just a suite of folders and subfolders and files. A file is a collection of information that has some sort of relationship, um, orders, payments. File extension is the three-digit code at the end of the file, which a lot of times will tell you what kind of file it is. TXT for text, CSV for comma-separated file, etc. Uh, file folder is just a way of categorizing or organizing our files to find them later on. A file folder could be one folder. It could be several folders deep with subfolders. The way we're going to talk about the processing in this class is from a business perspective or transaction perspective. Each file typically can have a series of records. A record is a line of data in that file. So if you were to open it up in Notepad, you would see a line of data. And you would see several fields across each line of data. Each line of data is a record. It would present information, let's say if it was order, about an order. And then that record would be divided into fields. Order number, order name, order cost, customer number. Each one of those records would have the same format. What we're going to do in this class is we're going to organize our records by character position. So fields 1 through 10 might be first name, 11 through 20 might be last name. <coughs> Excuse me. There are other file formats besides that. There's CSV or comma separated files, where every field is separated by a comma. There's tab, tab separated files. Okay. Uh, but character separation or character position is how we're going to work it. And then finally, the last uh, unit of measure with files in a file system is a character, and that's the smallest chunk of data. So characters become data fields, become records, become files in a file system. Here is that same information represented graphically. Uh, this particular file has been identified as a comma-separated file, but since we're not looking at the real file, we don't see the commas. What we do see is a diagram that shows that each record, and that's what this, I guess, stacking is, each one of these is a record, where there's a field called name, address, city, state, zip. This is a uh, diagram which actually has data in it for John, for, excuse me, John Doe, yes. 
And um, this is just to help you visual learners conceptualize what's happening inside that sequential file. Um, typically, you know, there's a lot of different ways and types of files. We're going to think of things from a business perspective where it's primarily master files and transaction files. A master file might be your customer file, and then the transaction file might be orders and payments. So if this is the, you know, electric company, your uh, electric billing has got a master record of your house with your address and probably what your current balance is. And then the transaction file would have all of the bills, invoices, and all the payments you had made, and they'd be summarized and put as an um, outstanding balance in the master record. That's typically how we want to look at things here. I've also got another diagram on the side, which is probably old news for most of us, but this is simply the pathing information for finding uh, files inside a file system. We start with a drive letter. We can have multiple folders, a file name, and then a file extension, which could be any number of things for text file, CSV, TAB for tab, TXT for text, and sometimes even ASC for ASCII. Here's some pseudocode that's very typical of file processing. And again, this is non-standard. This looks a little bit like a couple of programming languages, but it's not. But what you'll always have to do with text file processing is open the files, either for input or for output. Okay. And there's also some languages will let you do all, both at the same time. So you can read it for input and make updates. So your input could actually change the file as output. But we're not going to deal with that now. One file for input, one file for output. They're different files. I have a loop that's going to open the file that's for input. And it's going to basically read the first 10 characters and put it in product ID, the next 10 for product name, etc. There's a calculation in here. And then after it's done everything it needs to do with these variables or identifiers, it's going to write them out with a write statement to the output file. It'll go to the top of the loop, and basically the way this is going to work is it says, is there another product name to read? So if there's another record to read, it's going to go through the same process. It's going to write it out. It's going to come to the top again. Now at some point, it's going to run out of records to read. Product name will not exist anymore because it will have no information for product name. It'll drop out of this loop and then close the two files, the input and the output. And then what we should find on the um, hard drive is the output and the input file, but an updated output file with the input information, including that calculation in it. This is kind of a, a simplification of what actually could be happening in a regular program. I will have a Python program out there to show you how that works, to show you how it could change a little bit when you put this type of processing inside a uh, programming language. For the assignment, what you're going to do is you're going to have two files that you're going to read into those parallel arrays, which was done for the prior assignment. So instead of hard coding the arrays with values for, I think, product code and product amount, you're going to read the information in the file into the arrays and then do the same kind of processing you did in the previous assignment to look up the code, to find a code, and from that code go to the parallel array and find out how much it costs. It's that kind of a deal. So we're going to add to the previous assignment with a couple of files. You'll have to build the files, show me the files in your example and your uh, submissions. I will have a sample video ready for you in time for the assignment so you can see how I put my answer together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Databases. Um, databases have a lot of additional uh, functionality that doesn't exist with file systems. Um, there is improved security. There are, um, there are features built in databases that help reduce redundancy or data duplication. They're typically faster. Any kind of organization that has any amount of data to be held is probably going to consider a database. It's a very valuable tool. And all databases are essentially, um, in all the functions within it, are housed in what's called a database management system. The number one database out there is Oracle's. It's a relational object relational database. Microsoft has got one called SQL Server. Access is a database, but it's a simplified database. One of the things that happens with things like MySQL and SQL Server and Oracle's databases is that, for example, if um, you were in the middle of processing a, trend, a bunch of transactions, for example, maybe I was doing an update of all my customer information uh, payments and a monsoon storm came in and killed the power. Most of these databases, the bigger ones, the relational ones, are smart enough to do rollbacks, which means that if it lost the power, the system would go down. But when it came back out, it would sense the fact it didn't finish that unit of work 
it would back out everything it started with so that you could reapply the updates. Without that capability, you'd have to check and find out where this thing actually died and continue from there. I've had to do that with file system systems, and it's not a trivial task. So data redundancy, security, um, uh, data integrity, all of these things make a database valuable. And if you look at this in the book, you'll see this graphic a little bit more expanded, easier to read perhaps, and there'll be just a discussion of all this in there. Uh, what we'll be doing, or what we do to do with database management systems is we have an application program that passes authentication information, does some sort of query <coughs> or um, data manipulation language call to insert, update, delete data, uh, ret or return data back to the application program so that the user can uh, get their information. Essentially, Canvas, SIS are both uh, web-based systems that have web applications which talk to an Oracle database on the backside. So if you want an example of a database management system working with a web, think of Canvas. Now, database terms. The important thing here is there's a lot of similarity between databases and um, file system terminology, uh, with the exception that um, the terms are different. So uh, a database system is like a file system. A table is like a file. A row is like a record. A column is like a data field. Now, databases make extensive use of keys to avoid duplication. So usually you'll have a table. Each table has a primary. It doesn't have to, but typically it has a primary key. And it may have a foreign key, which is used to merge with another table. So for example, maybe all your employees are an employee table, but all the department information is in a department table. Well, then the um, employee table would have a foreign key that would be the department ID, which would map to the primary key of the department table, and that would facilitate joining those two tables in a report. What happens with databases is that there's a lot of smaller tables that are joined when you create reports and screens, whereas in a file system, the data gets duplicated a lot because it isn't easy to join data on the fly. So typically, you might have data in several different files, which can cause all kinds of problems during updates. Um, Finally, what you do with databases is typically the application side of it. When you process databases, you work with something called a data view, a data set, or a cursor, a result set. And what this means is, is you're going to issue an SQL query or some command against the database. It's going to return some information. That return information is going to be an array, if you will, a cursor or a data set that you can then process. That means you can update it, you can return it, you can flag things in it, just like you would in the other program. This is not a database class. It's not even a programming class. So I'm going to have to leave it at that. If you have any additional questions about uh, databases, then uh, let me know and I can give you some examples in Python that you can play with on your own time. Databases typically run off something called structured query language or SQL. It's a very English-like language which is used to do selections, insertions, updates, and deletes. A select simply just pulls data from the database. It may report it back to the user. For example, when you ask for, you know, maybe um, in Canvas, uh, if you're looking for a list of files, it would do a query, pull all the files, and return that in HTML as a list. It's not going to update anything for you. It's just returning that information that I stored in the database. That would be a select. If you change, the, if you insert new rows into a table, or database, you would use the insert. If you want to update any information inside a database row, or it could be in a, uh, a column, you would use the update command, and then finally you can delete tables with the delete command. And if you look at this, let's look at the insert. It says insert into employee, that's the table name. The columns would be social security name, last name, first name, salary. And then following the parentheses would be the values I want to insert in there. Now, typically in most GUI environments, what would probably happen is this information would be inside text boxes and your program would pull it. It would send the authentication information to the, to the database so that make sure that you had right access to the table. And then it would issue this command to actually update the table. And since there's a lot more security with databases than there is with file systems, if you don't have the ability to write or delete or update data, it will not let you. This is one of the nice things about uh, databases. You get much better data integrity because you can restrict 
who does what and how they do it. Again, a very big topic. I would suggest if you're interested in this in greater uh, detail, take MySQL, take PHP. Um, I know in my Python class, we get a little bit of the SQL. Um, in the advanced programming class, you're more likely to see some SQL processing also. That concludes the files database sections of the textbook. If you have any questions, please let me know.